I had when I was when I was younger, first uh, at undergraduate even, I had a, a, the reverse of writer's block. I had kind of a red shoes syndrome, in that um, it was very hard for me to stop writing when I once I wrote, and so I had an old Apple computer, one of those boxes if you can recall those, and um, once I I put fingers to keyboard, I found it incredibly hard to stop for food, or the restroom, that wasn't really stopping, it was close enough, but it, it was very hard to, so it was, it was hard to write anything but short pieces, because once I was done, I could magically be finished and walk away and leave it at that. So I wrote an incredible number of uh, short sketches for the theater or television, uh, and so I, uh, my career sort of veered off toward thinking, maybe I should write for Saturday Night Live, uh, until I called Lorne Michaels at home one day. <laughs> And, and he advised me never to do that again. Um, and so that sort of quelled my thirst for Saturday Night Live. And um, I sort of broke that habit eventually, was able to write longer, just you know, kind of be a person again, and stop, and go eat, and sleep. And, and so then I was able to write longer pieces. But um, what I found about writing prose pieces, other than the really delicate and interesting work of something that was new to me. For, I had always leaned toward, I think you always lean toward things that you're, you find, at least you buffalo yourself into believing you're good at. And um, I found I was able to say something and create situations through dialogue that worked on stage and worked for me as that first audience that the writer is. And so that became the voice for me, first in theater, then in film. Um, but the descriptive passages were always the most tedious and the ones that I found that I didn't really spend much time with. Man sits at table and then I would go from there. Um, so the notion of actually writing a, a story, of, of taking that idea and, and then creating something that, that you know, is an entire world through description was um, kind of daunting to me. But the pleasure came from the idea, this started really about maybe a year, year and a half ago, writing short stories. And it came on planes. I found myself traveling a great deal as the kind of nomadic job that I have would, would see fit. So on a trip from New York to California or from Chicago to London, I don't know where exactly, I started writing a story. And I thought, when I got off the plane and had finished something, you know, a draft, that was a great pleasure to have written five pages or 10 pages, and that was it, rather than five pages of 120 pages that still needed to come. So that was probably the beginnings, as auspicious or inauspicious as that may be. Uh, it was another form, another medium, another outlet for me to write, that red shoes mentality still being there of loving to write. I don't really have a recipe. I don't write at a certain hour. I don't wear a certain thing. And I must not look out on a certain pond. Some people do, and God bless them. That's their, you know, for me, it's the formula is whatever works. And what works for me is, you know, walking around and babbling to myself, usually. And then at some point, laying hands on keyboard, pen to paper, whatever it is. And then it usually comes relatively quickly. Uh, but there's a process in which I, I think about it a fair amount. Uh, at least the beginning of the flight, until they say seatbelt's off and then I'm ready to go. So that's where it came from, this notion of could I, could I do something that I hadn't done before. Um, if you read this at any point, or what you'll listen to briefly uh, today, you'll see a great deal of, of what I already know in the idea of dialogue. One piece in particular here is completely dialogue. And uh, part of that was, again, that idea, can I tell an entire story simply through dialogue without any description of anything else in that world other than, than what comes out of their mouth? And of course, you can. You can do just about anything. Can you do it well is the question. Um, so in the same way that as a film director, I dragged a great deal of what I knew directing on stage into that arena, I then dragged all of that back into the world of writing prose. That visualization that I've learned more and more from film, um, and the world of, of dialogue, dramatic dialogue. So um, hopefully you'll get a mix of, of that in these 20 stories that make up Seconds of Pleasure. 
It's called Seconds of Pleasure because that's what I pretty much imagined at best I would be able to give people. Um, but it's also, and that's stretching it, uh, that is a, a title of a song by Elvis Costello. And the book is dedicated to him because he's someone that I've worked with and, and admired for a long time. But he, he did music for, in fact, for the film that uh, is playing tonight, Shape of Things. Uh, not on stage. On stage it was the Smashing Pumpkins. But in the, in the film, for a particular reason, I chose to go with a, a different kind of music. And um, he's someone I've hoped to collaborate with on a musical and just it, basically coming up with reasons to hang out around him in some fashion. Um, but I, I, I knew the title of this song, Seconds of Pleasure. And then he let me know that actually he had um, stolen it from Nick Lowe, who has produced him a number of times. And a band that Nick Lowe was with called Rock Pile had an album called Seconds of Pleasure. Uh, but the original root of it was Nick Lowe saying that that's what kind of proudly he always imagined that he brought his girlfriend, was Seconds of Pleasure. And it seemed apt to the stories that, uh, that I was telling. As I, there was a point where, again, I was writing for pleasure, and then the idea that perhaps you could collect these into a book I began to start, I began to think about the shape of what I was doing, what the overall theme and fashion in which these, these would hold together. Um, and seconds of pleasure seemed quite apt in terms of the brevity of them and then the kind of overreaching longing that, um, that exists, I think, in, in all of them in some way. Um, and if I'm wrong, you know, assuming I didn't actually read the whole thing, but it seems pretty good. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so, I would love to read a, a story for you now uh, called Maraschino that is um, originally appeared in a magazine called Black Book and uh, is included here in this collection. It was good to see him again. Really, it was. He hadn't actually changed a lot. I mean, not that much. A little, I guess, but I, I spotted him immediately. Almost, anyway. Just a couple of minutes after he walked in. He did have some kind of exotic type drink in his hands, a Typhoon Betty or something, so I suppose he must have been inside long enough to buy that, but I caught his eye a second later. He was nibbling on the cherry. I forget the name of those. What is it? You know, the, the one from his glass when we looked at each other. Anyway, we had one of those, like, things across the room. We did, honestly. Uh, the kind from a, a TV movie or something. He saw me. I'd already seen him, as I said. And we just stared at each other. Must have been for around four minutes at least. Music blaring people up and moving around the place. But you, you know how a lounge in a Holiday Inn can be on a Wednesday. But we didn't feel any of it. I didn't, anyhow. It was suddenly just him and me. I, w I was only in town for a day and a half flying to Sacramento on Friday morning early. So, you know, not exactly expecting a blast from the past. And yet, there he was cherry stem in his mouth and staring straight at me. It was, it was obvious he didn't recognize me outright, but I, I must have struck a chord or something. The angle of his body as he stood there, head cocked a little to one side and that half smile. But I, I, I guess he couldn't place me. Which is okay. It's, it's been a while and I'm sure I look different in a business suit. See, I, I work for a big pharmacy chain in marketing, so I need to have the look. You know, keep the corporate thing going. So that was probably part of it. As he, as he talks to me, I realize pretty quick that this isn't his first drink, not even his third. So no wonder he doesn't remember me, the face or any of it. But he's smiling throughout. Not a, not a cheap, kind of irritating smile, but a, the, the real kind, a smile, smile. Chatting me up about who I work for when I graduated brand of bra. You know, the usual. Not slurring the words yet, but a stumble or two. When he whispers my cup size back to me, I'm suddenly a 63C. Now, maybe he's dyslexic, but I don't think so. Simple mistake, I figure. It's the drink talking. I understand this, so I just grin, grin back at him, and answer dutifully on everything he asks, wondering if something I say will set off a bell in his head, maybe a whistle. Just a flicker, even something in those tired, distant eyes of his. Sitting there on the bed of his junior suite, 20 minutes later. I'm still half hoping he'll remember me. It'd make this a whole bunch easier. 
well, not, not easier, I suppose, but, but more like a reunion than some other kind of thing. It doesn't really matter, I guess, but it would certainly be interesting. As close as he comes is that I remind him of someone. He says this more, more to himself than anything as he's pulling off his socks. You know, the, the thin, stretchy kind. He tugs at one reinforced toe as he stares at my belly button, eyes traveling down as he mumbles a name. I ask who she is, the name. Say that, that I won't be offended, but he turns back to his heel and says that it's nothing. No one. Some lady from when he was younger, an ex-wife, when I press him. I promise myself right then that if he, he spots me, figures it out somehow, a gesture or the way I raise my eyebrows, even anything, then I'll let him go. But he doesn't. So I don't. It's funny, lying there, letting him fuck me like that. Well, maybe not funny, exactly, but different. He looks, he looks down from time to time, studying my mouth, but mostly he just grunts and sighs and pushes on. At one point, he asks me to turn over to try it that way, but I resist and tell him I like looking at him. So eventually, he closes his eyes and gets on with it. Near the end, his body tensing, I wonder if he used to fuck her like this, my mother. I saw them once, do, doing it, I mean, but I was really too young to recall much. And did he fuck that first woman he left us for this way, or the second wife? Who knows? Not me, I was only six. I'm still wondering this as I pull my blazer back on, run a hand through my hair, and kiss his cheek. We lock eyes again. I give him a last chance, but nothing. He's, he's too busy with those socks of his. Oh, he does check the corridor for me, though. That was nice. Opens the door a few inches, a towel around his heavy waist, and then out I go. I turn only once when I reach the safety of the ice machine, <clears throat> but a nod is all we muster. No need for a hallway promise, an exchange of business cards, some half-forgotten email address. No. Just a smile, and that's, that's enough. It's kind of far away, but I'd, I'd swear he opens his mouth again to speak. He st stops, though. Stops himself, probably catching another woman's name on his tongue. My mom's. Someone else's. Doesn't matter. Anyway, it was, it was good to see him again. Really, it was. <clears throat> so I don't recall if I mentioned that it was obviously a holiday book. Um, <laughs> kind of a good, you know, Christmas is coming, as they say. Um, it's one of those. It's really good, you know, just any time, cheery, really, any time of the year, um, sort of things. So I'll prove that now, actually, by reading another little piece, if I could. It's a quarter of. Um, and then we'll, we'll take a listen to some actual actors tear into this thing. Um, this is called Spring Break. I thought this would be a good one because it takes place on a college campus. I'm not ruining it. You find that out right away, very near the beginning. Spring break, I mean, pretty obvious, for God's sake. <clears throat> That's at the end, like halfway, three quarters of the way through the year. There's a year or a week you take off. Spring break, you know what I'm talking about. He looks at the tears in her eyes and thinks twice about proceeding. Well, not twice, really. Not like in the sense that he isn't going to go through with it. The breakup, I mean. But imagines that they can maybe wait for a moment, get their bearings, regroup. Then he figures, screw it, let's get this done, I got class, and pushes on. It's not that he doesn't care about her, not exactly, anyway, but just that he's in a hurry. His 1.30 tutorial is way across campus, and on a good day he practically has to run to get there on time. And this is definitely not that, a good day. No way is this going into the pantheon of very fine days that he set aside for himself. This is not even close. It starts with the 
we need to talk call he barely catches in the bathroom when he switches his cell on just to check the messages. 7 a.m. and she's already calling the house. What if he'd accidentally left the phone on and that had happened in the breakfast nook or as he was sitting down to watch Good Morning America for 10 minutes with the family? Not good. That's what that is. No way you get out of explaining a 7 a.m. call to your cell phone. I don't care who you are. One of those takes plenty of explaining. Plenty. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be there, I promise, he whispers into the receiver over the protective hiss of his shower water. I will, Jesus. I said, I promise, okay? He hangs up and slips the Motorola deep into his bathroom pocket for safekeeping as he starts to peel off his jockeys. He glances in the mirror, mercifully frosting over now, and promises a day or two at the gym this week. And if not this week, then definitely the next, since break will be starting up and he'll have a little more time to himself. A lot more, actually, if he can get her off his back for five minutes. He knows that only a breakup, I mean a, a complete severing of this relationship, can make that happen. <clears throat> and he begins to steel himself to the idea as he steps into the steamy glass box before him. He taps himself on the head, muttering, dumb shit, <clears throat> under his breath and returns to the robe, switches off the phone, jumps back into the shower. Hustling up the long stairway that leads from the fac faculty parking lot to the main campus, he has a moment for reflection. Hair still damp, he begins to think. Which is pretty dangerous, at the best of times. Before a breakup, it's practically a death wish. Thinking is overrated, anyway. He philosophizes as he lumbers up the stairs, pushing, pausing halfway for a breather. A freshman, maybe a sophomore, it's definitely the backside of an under 20, dashes past and continues the ascent. Probably doesn't have a sticker, he imagines. Consoling himself with this notion between breaths, couldn't afford it, so she's got to park in the outer lots. This makes him feel better about himself, his station in life, if only briefly. He turns now, readying himself for the final push to the summit, all the while wondering who was the genius that decided to put a, a set of steep step, a st a steep set of stairs next to the faculty parking area. A woman, he mutters, just aloud, trying to take the last two steps simultaneously. He just catches the edge of his left rock board on the granite lip of the landing and goes down hard on one knee. Assessing the damage, he spots a tiny tear in his dockers. Hardly noticeable, but it's going to bug him for the rest of the day. Definitely some woman architect, he says absently. Not to anyone in particular, but just as a statement of fact. He remembers reading it somewhere in one of those crappy color brochures he's received in his welcome packet, maybe. Women, for the most part, designed the whole college. And now it seems as though he's the one who's going to have to pay for it. A glance at his fossil tells him he's still got an hour before the fateful showdown, or encounter. He prefers this to showdown, with its relatively bad connotations of a hail of bullets and someone being buried in an unmarked grave, as someone who looks remarkably like himself. Yes, better to think of it as simply an encounter, a meeting between two modern, savvy, educated people. He smiles at this, imagining that some good might actually come out of the meeting. He checks his watch again, remembering that she isn't free until 12.30, what with her karate class and all. Well, it's, it's self-defense, to be fair, but all that stuff is some sort of karate. That's how he sees it, anyway. It's all Asian, and it's all beyond me. He'd said at dinner one time, causing a silence to slip over the entree like a fog bank. He'd actually watched her once, back when he'd been obsessed with her, or liked her, at least, sneak down to the field house when her class was where her class was and sat in the stands studying her. The way her perfect little body moved, the tilt of her head as she performed a throw or moved into a stance. His mind started to drift. No cause for alarm, this often happened. And he could easily imagine himself at the mercy of one of those tosses. Some sort of argument about girls and parties or whatever and there he'd be, cartwheeling through the air, end over end, past the Art Deco lamp that she loves and down onto her glass coffee table crash. With her temper, redheads are famous for that, this was not out of the realm of possibility, not even out of the fiefdom. It could happen. He had shuddered at the thought, then slipped back out of the auditorium without her knowing. If he was honest with himself, which he rarely felt much, if any, compulsion to be, he'd been thinking about this breakup for a while now, planned it out in his head like a peck-and-paw action sequence. Maybe it was the karate class she was in, but the idea of breaking up with her always came with images of shattering glass and spurting blood, all in slow motion. Even 
horses, which made no real sense but helped complete the analogy. And there was nothing he disliked more than some cheap aborted analogy. Bad analogies sucked as far as he was concerned. He bides some of the remaining time watching coeds, not any that he would be interested in. Rebounding is difficult and can easily be messed up. It's very simple to jump too fast, too far, and end up in the same snake pit as before. Girls are tricky, he reasons, content for the moment to simply look, wait, imagine. He prides himself on being great at imagining. Several cuties wander past, giggling and fairly intent on wasting their parents' money. Two or three catch his eye, throw him a smile. One he sort of knows a little from last semester. They might have even gone out once or hooked up at some post-finals blowouts. It's hard to recall with girls like that. The gap-clad, Aber Abercrombie-assed, ponytailed masses get harder and harder to differentiate the longer he's at this place. So he decides to do what he always does. Smile back. Something about her, a brushing of her bangs as she passes, suggests that they've slept together, but he has no hard evidence to support this. He'd have to see her naked, to be sure. And there is no chance of that right now. Of this, he is quite certain. See, he never forgets a body. Not ever. And in his own humble way, he prides himself on this. Every foot, elbow, curve of the neck is cataloged somewhere in that head of his. Why do they care so much if we recall a birthday or some, some damn anniversary, he wonders, when it is so much more caring to make note of the length of her calves, the bridge of her nose, and in perfection, the dances in her left pupil. All this is important. The rest is the artifice. It's edging toward 1245 when he spots her, making a move through the library crowd, her precise haircut cutting this way and that as she moves to the reading lounge. He has absently picked up a copy of Bazaar, but discards it now, knowing how she hates it when he tears out the photos. Not to, not to pin to his office wall or anything silly like that, but just to consider in private. An attractive girl, one who has managed to get herself on Bazaar anyway, is always worth a second glance. She sits on the black vinyl chair next to him, a fake Barcelona, with an easy, inscrutable grace, thanks to the karate training, he reasons, and looks at him. Make that stares. Not a word out of her, just the death stare, like that one tractor beam thingy in Star Wars, locked on him and ready to do some damage. One hand twitching. Probably deciding which punch to throw first. Maybe rip his heart out and show it to him before he dies, that old Bruce Lee classic. <clears throat> he sits back on his cushioned love seat a bit, hoping, hopefully just out of her range, and decides to pitch right in. And then it happens. The crying starts up. He's got to give her some credit here because this is, this is pretty smooth, this tactic. He hadn't even come up with a game plan for this one. Nope, he'd, he'd, he'd run the shouting match fisticuffs chase across campus scenario through his head a dozen times, but this middle brow, mascara running, silent plea for sympathy hadn't even seemed like a remote possibility. Look, I, 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 I could say a, a, a bunch of stuff, really, all kinds of pretty standard guy crap that you'd see through, and none of it would make this any easier, so I'm, I might as well just say it. Okay? He checks to see how that worked, whether it <clears throat> appears to have any less lasting effect. She remains quiet, though, like some jazz age painting. It's her bobbed hairdo that brings this to mind, simply looking back at him, silent. I, I, I really like what we had, you know, all those, those, those dinners and, and, and movies at your place. You're, you're great. You, you, you totally are, and I, and I love being in class with you. I, I learned a ton, honestly. You're, you're, you're awesome with Shakespeare. Taming the Shrew really, really came alive for me. But um, I, just, I, don't, I just don't dig this anymore, all right? I mean, not, not so much. Nothing from her. A couple more tears, but they're starting to mean less and less now that he's waist deep in them. I, I just, I feel, I feel like, like we were becoming too serious and people are like, you know, getting suspicious. Yeah, I, I, I even had a few guys ask me about it. 
my parents too, and I, I know I shouldn't be living with them and whatnot, I know that, but that's, that's a whole other issue. Look, bottom line is, I'm 23, and, and you're the head of my department. <laughs> my dad even works for you. Uh, that's heavy when you, when you think about it. It really is. I, I, I also, no offense, but uh, I think you're sort of a, a mother figure to, for me, and, and that's, that's starting to freak me out. It was cool at first. I mean, not that my mom has a body like yours or anything, but it's, it's getting so I can't see the real you because of it. Okay, time to wrap it up now. He's spinning his wheels, he can feel it, and he just needs to introduce a strong finish here and be done with this nonsense. I, I guess, I guess overall, I just, I, I, I just don't really like you that much. <laughs> not enough, anyhow. I mean, I like you, I'll always like you, but uh, he flinches as she stands because she may be assuming an attack position. <laughs> His hands start to involuntarily move, just to protect the face. When he realizes that she's only grabbing her purse, rising up to smooth out her skirt, she doesn't say a word as she turns and starts off. Well, hey, that wasn't so bad, he whispers, congratulating himself on the overall ease of the operation. But it's, it's not over yet. He should have known better than that. She pivots in the foyer about 30 yards away and stares back at him, just stares, burning twin holes through the front of his old navy sweater. A minute goes by, maybe two. Then, out of nowhere, she lashes out with one foot at a wooden book return cart. Ninja-like. Her loafer makes contact, and the rolling shelf careens across the marble, smacking a pillar and spilling copies of National Geographic across the floor. A few paperbacks. She misses most of this, however, having turned away on impact. She is more intent on quickly making her way out through the security doors. The last he sees of her is that haircut zipping past the undergrads on her way to the English department. Jeez, she's crazy. <laughs> he consoles himself with this as he stands, faking a yawn. As an afterthought, he reaches down and tears the cover from the bizarre magazine shoves it down into his cargo pants as he heads off in the opposite direction. Toward his tutorial, toward spring break, toward freedom. <laughs>